Good evening, everyone. My name is Artemis Kirk, University Librarian at Georgetown. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for the second annual Tannis Family Endowed Lecture. Peter J. Tannis, college class of 1960, though he looks more like class of 1990, is a member of the Georgetown Library Board. He established the Tannis Family Endowed Lecture Fund in 2010 in honor of Lawinger Library's 40th anniversary and as part of the university's campaign for generations to come. We're very proud that the library has a role in the campaign and we are on our way to meeting our goal of $25 million. And if you have spare change afterward, we'd be happy to have you contribute to that goal. We're very grateful to Peter and Anne for the gift and we're very excited to host the second annual lecture this year with a spectacular lecturer. I would ask you to join me, please, in thanking Peter and Ann Tannis for this wonderful gift to the library. I also want very much to thank the library staff who have organized this event and are here with us this evening. Jenny Smith, Annie Lorenzana, David Hagen, Amy Richards, our students Megan Wang and Veronica Dulin, and our Director of Development, Miriam Nickerson. They put everything together, they've done all the work. It's just great fun for me to be here to introduce them to you as well. I have the pleasure to introduce our featured speaker this evening, Dennis Lockhart. Dennis is the 14th President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. He is responsible for all the bank's activities, including monetary policy, bank supervision and regulation, and payment services, and is a member of the Federal Reserve's chief monetary policy body, the Federal Open Market Committee. Dennis earned a BA in political science and economics from Stanford University and an MA in international economics and American foreign policy from the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. He also attended the Senior Executive Program at MIT's Sloan School of Management and served also as an officer in the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve. He hasn't done too much yet. Prior to his appointment at the Federal Reserve, Dennis Lockhart served on the faculty of the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. So it's a great pleasure to welcome back Dennis Lockhart. <laughs> Artemis, thank you for that introduction. It was mercifully short, and I appreciate that because I'm tired of hearing the same bio over and over again. Uh, very nice to be back here at Georgetown. Uh, I spent four very pleasant years as a professor in the master's program here of, in the Foreign Service School. Um, had great students and was uh, happily ensconced as a professor when the opportunity arose to join the Federal Reserve. And, and, you know, very candidly, my thought at the time was I always wanted to do a little uh, public service, and this can't be too hard. After all, I'll just make a few speeches and go to a few meetings. And so I uh, decamped from the Foreign Service School to the Federal Reserve in March of 2007 and ushered in the worst financial crisis in history <laughs> and uh, the, one of the deepest recessions we've ever had. My good friends see cause and effect there. Where I go, trouble tends to accumulate. So it's been quite an interesting ride. But I, I, I want to thank Peter and Ann Tannis <clears throat> for not only for their gift to the library, but for the opportunity to come here and speak, I have great fondness for Georgetown. It is a family affair. My daughter uh, was a student here in the Foreign Service School um, at, in the master's program when I was a professor. She purposefully did not make eye contact with me for six months while, it's until the students figured out that there was a connection by last names. And then she met her prince here, a Spanish diplomat, now a Spanish diplomat, and uh, they live in Madrid together. So I have two Georgetown grads and my own Georgetown background, and the two of them produced a, uh, my first grandchild November 17th. So this afternoon, I went to the bookstore just to uh, impress you with my loyalty to Georgetown. Aww. 
So I can't wait to um, present that. They'll, they'll consider it a lot of fun. <clears throat> so again, Peter and Anne, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, today I'm going to explore the challenge of estimating full employment and the impl implications for monetary policy. You're going to need a road map, but I took seriously that this is a lecture, not a speech, so it's a little longer than my normal talks. So to give you a road map of my remarks, um, first I'll, I'll start with an assessment of current economic conditions in the first quarter of 2014. I'll follow that by laying out my outlook for full year 2014 and the early months of 2015. It's axiomatic in monetary policy that the stance of policy should fit the outlook. It's forward-looking. Monetary policy has its effect with a lag, so we're always looking ahead and trying to fit policy to that view of the world. I'll explain the current position of, uh, of policy and give you my opinion of its appropriateness. I'll then discuss the questions about the direction of policy that are on the public mind and the mind of financial market participants. I'll argue that the most important question is the timing of the first increase of the Fed's policy interest rate. And I'll share with you my framework for thinking about that important decision. In my thinking, there are two dominant and equal considerations in the decision to raise interest rates. They are, in shorthand, inflation and employment. I plan in these remarks to give my, uh, most of my attention to employment, or more to the point, full employment. And I'll argue that there remains considerable slack in the country's employment situation. Some might add a third consideration, and that is financial stability. I'll touch on that subject, but I'm going to treat it, I actually made up this phrase, but it's the best I could do, as an ever-present, ever-pertinent contextual requirement, meaning we've got to have financial stability within which then we pursue full employment and stable prices. As you follow my line of thinking this evening, please remember that you're hearing my personal views. I'm not speaking for the Federal Reserve or the Federal Open Market Committee, and my colleagues may not see things the way I do. The recession ended, uh, and the recovery began in the summer of 2009. For the first four years of recovery, gross domestic product, or GDP growth, averaged just over 2%. In the second half of 2013, however, the economy appeared to pick up momentum. Growth in the third and fourth quarters of last year averaged three and a quarter percent on an annualized basis. We entered 2014 with high hopes that the economy would continue to experience a phase of accelerated growth that might be sustained for some time. Many forecasters, including those uh, at a number of the Federal Reserve Banks, foresaw growth in 2014 around 3%. Since then, the economic, and since the beginning of the year, the economic indicators have been mixed and generally softer than expected. Overall consumer spending rose strongly in January, but was heavily concentrated in home utility expenditures, power consumption, gas consumption. That's because colder than usual weather hit many regions of the country. Auto sales, which were strong in 2013, slowed sharply at year end and early in 2014. Likewise, home sales and housing starts have fallen off since last fall. Industrial activity has shown quite a bit, uh, has slowed quite a bit since last October, 
following a mid-2013 surge. There was a pronounced decline in manufacturing production uh, in January. However, survey data on factory, uh, on, on factory orders, that is orders uh, to be produced in the coming weeks in February, showed a modest increase. For each of these data points, bad weather is thought to have had a significant adverse influence on the reported number. Indeed, my research staff estimates that real gross domestic product growth in the first quarter may have been reduced by about three quarters of a percentage point, again, on an annualized basis, due to bad weather. I have seen roughly similar estimates from other sources, though I think actually that all estimates are necessarily more impressionistic than precise. I think we could see an uptick in activity in the second quarter of this year as business activity rebounds and some catch up in sales and production occurs. If this is the case, Forecasts of stronger growth in line with the second half of last year may still play out. The alternative view, however, is that this quarter signals incipient renewed weakness, another false dawn. So I would say there is some ambiguity at the moment around the current state of the economy. In my personal outlook for 2014 and the beginning of 2015, I am holding to an optimistic outlook. And by optimistic, I mean a resumption of growth after the soft first quarter closer to a 3% annual pace. That rate of growth should bring continuing solid employment gains and a healthier economy in general, including a healthier rate of inflation. As I said, current conditions are ambiguous. <clears throat> so why am I not succumbing to doubts, you might ask? Because, in my view, the economy's fundamentals are stronger, and the headwinds that have buffeted the economy and restrained growth are weaker. Let me expand on this claim that the economy's fundamentals are stronger. I think basic conditions in several key sectors of the economy are much improved compared with earlier in the recovery period. I would cite housing, banking, manufacturing, and energy, just for example. Household balance sheets are much healthier now thanks to reduced debt, higher savings, and stronger asset prices, including higher home values. Business and financial system leverage has been significantly reduced from levels pre-crisis that were demonstrated by the crisis and the, and the recession to be unsustainable. Business profitability is good, and in general, the balance sheets of firms are generally liquid. Likewise, fiscal imbalances at the governmental level, while not solved for the long term, are somewhat less a concern in the near term. And finally, employment markets are unquestionably in, in, in a better state compared to even a year ago. At the same time, certain headwinds, as I mentioned a moment ago, that have persistently buffeted the economy and restrained growth appear to have lessened. The fiscal drag associated with federal government budget austerity measures has eased. The risk of another financial meltdown emanating from Europe seems to have receded. Concerns about European sovereign debt and the exposure of the European banking system were an important source of uncertainty that weighed heavily on business confidence 
in the years 2011, 2012, for instance. That said, we live in a world where change can come quickly. At the moment, the Ukraine situation is front of mind. The situation presents some risk, particularly to Europe. Disruption of the European economy could spill over to our own in some measure. The situation calls for close monitoring of developments. More broadly, slowing growth in certain emerging market economies, a potential headwind, bears watching. Stepping back, though, my overall assessment is that conditions have significantly improved. In my view, the current stance of the committee's policy appropriately aligns with the outlook that I laid out a moment ago. In December, the Federal Open Market Committee made the decision to begin tapering its program of asset purchases. The level of monthly purchases now stands at $65 billion per month, down from $85 billion. The foundational policy instrument, the target for the federal funds rate, remains near zero. The policy rate has been as low as it effectively can go for more than five years. Importantly, the committee has communicated through what it calls forward guidance that interest rate policy is likely to stay put for a while longer. So in spite of phasing out the phasing out of asset purchases, the intended overall position of policy in Fed speak is highly accommodative. And I think this is appropriate and needed. So this is where we are today as regards policy. The public, including importantly participants in financial markets, is focused at the moment on two questions about the course of policy. The public wants to know under what conditions might the committee reverse course on tapering, either pause the wind down of purchases or actually increase the monetary stimulus that asset purchases aim to deliver. There is, in my opinion, a high bar to reversing course, and that's certainly my position. Unless the economy takes a major turn for the worse or a spell of intense disinflation develops, I expect the program to be completely wound down by the end of the year. The second question, in, the mind, uh, in my mind, the more salient of the two, is the timing of what we call liftoff. Liftoff is the date when the policy rate and presumably all interest rates will begin to rise. In my bank's official forecast, we're putting liftoff in, this, in the back half of 2015. Now I would I'd like to frame for you how I, as one policymaker, I'm thinking about the liftoff decision. I think there are two considerations that should affect the timing of liftoff. <clears throat> they are inflation and employment. Inflation, which is sometimes called price stability, and employment, which is expressed as maximum employment or full employment, have been assigned to the Fed uh, by Congress as the primary objectives of monetary policy. They are captured in the so-called dual mandate. I want to spend most of my remaining time talking about the employment side of our dual mandate, but let me comment briefly on inflation. In January 2012, the Fed established a formal inflation target of 2%. The official time horizon for achieving this uh, target was stated as over the long run or over the longer run. It says 
over the longer run, which I take to mean most of the time, not in the longer run, which I would translate as eventually. 2% over the longer run is the Fed's notion of a healthy rate of inflation, and it's our definition of price stability. Today, inflation is running well below the 2% target. The January headline index called Personal Consumption Expenditures, or PCE index, showed inflation at 1.2% for the last 12 months. The 12-month rate for the core PCE index, and core means it excludes volatile food and energy prices, was 1.1%. And there's not been much movement in the rate of inflation now for several months. At the moment, inflation does not seem to be moving higher. Business contacts, and most of my contacts are in the southeast, tell me that they have very little, if any, pricing power. The FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, would like to see the inflation rate rise to 2% over the coming many months. In my official forecast, I'm projecting just that as a byproduct of a sustained quicker pace of growth. In, in my view, the unhealthy low rate of inflation justifies continuing monetary stimulus. There are times when accelerating inflation require putting the brakes on monetary stimulus. This is not one of the case at the, at the moment. Our inflation objective and full employment objective are not in conflict. They are complementary objectives at this time. So now let me turn to the second consideration in a liftoff decision the outlook for achieving full or, you might say, maximum employment. The current official rate of unemployment is 6.6%. More than a year ago, the Federal Open Market Committee set out a threshold of 6.5% as a criterion for beginning to consider a rate hike. Later, the committee updated its rate guidance with a statement that it expects the policy rate to remain at its current level well past achievement of 6.5%. Given that measured unemployment is so close to 6.5%, the time is approaching for a refreshed explanation of how unemployment or broader employment conditions are to be factored into a liftoff decision. In my mind, this requires a revisiting of what constitutes full employment. Unfortunately, defining full employment is a harder question than answering whether we are close to ach achieving full employment. If all we had to go on was the official unemployment rate, we might think that we are rapidly approaching what you might call full utilization of the nation's labor resources. There has been a significant, significant decline in the unemployment rate. It was 10% at its peak and nearly 8% at the beginning of last year. And as I said, it's at 6.6% today. Tomorrow, we get an updated number. So stay tuned tomorrow morning, 8.30 tomorrow morning. I think the current official unemployment rate may overstate the overall health of and progress achieved in employment conditions. As you may be aware, the interpretation of following, falling unemployment has been complicated by a decline in participation in the workforce. Let me explain what it means to be a participant in the workforce. 
The data used to construct the unemployment rate come from a survey of households conducted by the Census Bureau for the Bureau of Labor Statistics to be counted as a participant in the labor force. A respondent must give rather specific qualifying answers to questions in the survey. To be counted as a member of the labor force and therefore to be counted in the calculation of official unemployment, respondents have to indicate they were either working or available to work in the previous month. Evidence of availability for work is the claim to have actively sought employment in that month. Otherwise, they're not in the labor force. The Census Bureau gets a variety of answers to its questions, as you might imagine. Some say they do not want a job. Others say they are available for work, but have not looked for employment in the last month. Some who are counted as employed say they're working part-time but would like a full-time job. Those who are available, that is, and have looked for work in the past year, but have not recently, in the last month, looked for work, are labeled as marginally attached to the labor force. The term is marginally attached. They are not in the official labor force, so they are not officially unemployed. You might say they are part of a shadow labor force. The makeup of the class um, of marginally attached workers is interestingly quite fluid. About 40% of the marginally attached in any given month join the official labor force in the subsequent month. But only about 10% of those who move into the labor force find a job right away. In effect, they went from unofficially unemployed to officially unemployed. I think there is a strong case for assuming that at least a fraction of the marginally attached should be treated as unemployed even though they don't show up in the standard measure of unemployment. Let me insert here a short tutorial, this will take me back to my Georgetown days, a short tutorial on the hierarchy of unemployment measures published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. There are six levels, U1 through U6. Each has its own technical definition that includes or excludes categories of workers. The official headline unemployment rate, which I said a couple times, stands at 6.6%, is U3. One measure, not the only one, but one measure that counts the marginally attached in the pool of the unemployed is U6, the last of that series. U6 also includes people, uh, working people who identify themselves as working part-time for economic reasons. These are people who want to work full-time, and full-time is defined as 35 hours or more, but are only able to get fewer than 35 hours of work. In official unemployment statistics, these part-time workers count equally with full-time workers. In my view, people who work part-time for economic reasons might be thought of as partially unemployed. And among those economic reasons might be that the economy, in spite of recent growth, is not yet strong enough to close the actual, if not fully measured, employment gap. Here's my point. What U6 captures matters. Measures such as marginally attached and part-time for economic reasons became elevated in the recession and have not come down materially. 
Said differently, broader measures of unemployment like U6 suggests that a significant level of slack remains in our employment markets. So what's going on with the marginally attached? And what's going on even with some of the completely detached from the labor force? The health, the health of the labor market clearly affects decisions of individuals to enroll in school, to apply for disability insurance benefits, or to stay home to take care of house or family. Discouragement over job prospects rose during the Great Recession, causing many unemployed people to drop out of the labor force and others not to enter the labor force. People make a participation choice based on their sense from what they hear of employment prospects, the costs associated with going to work, for example, commuting costs or child care or elder care or housekeeping costs, and the feasibility of alternatives to work, perhaps school or part-time tasks that are compensated in cash. People are well attuned to incentives, disincentives, and their opportunity costs. Individuals make personal evaluations in answer to the question, am I or are we as a household net better off if I go to work? I would argue that the responses of people in the surveys that determine the data are not independent of the prevailing economic conditions. If the economy were hitting on all cylinders, these people might give different answers. As a policymaker, I am concerned about the unemployed in the official labor force, but I'm also concerned about the unemployed in the shadow labor force. To get close to full employment as I think about it would involve substantial absorption of this shadow labor force. I don't think we're near that point yet. This is one of the reasons I support continuing with a highly accommodative policy and deferring liftoff for a while longer. Earlier, I drew your attention, in the beginning of my talk, I drew your attention to the two objectives of the Fed's dual mandate as key considerations in a liftoff decision. Before I close, let me draw attention to a related consideration that could influence the liftoff decision, and that is financial stability or the risk of financial instability. Financial stability can be viewed as a factor that is closely allied with our statutory, statutorily mandated objectives. A spell of financial instability, if severe enough, could be a spoiler in the Fed's pursuit of stable prices and full employment through its accommodative policy stance. The first line of defense against financial instability would most likely be the use of uh, the tools of macro prudential supervision of banks and the financial system. But speaking for myself, I don't completely rule out a situation in which emerging threats would influence the stance of policy. Since I'm here at Georgetown, I'll mention and lean on my colleague, Governor Dan Terullo, who also has a Georgetown connection, having been a law professor downtown, who recently addressed the pertinent role of financial stability concerns in our policymaking. He said, incorporating financial stability considerations into monetary policy decisions need not imply the creation of an additional mandate for monetary policy. The potentially huge effect on price stability and employment associated with bouts of serious financial instability gives ample justification. 
So let me sum up. Current economic conditions are ambiguous, but, but I believe that after a weak first quarter, the economy will resume growing at the accelerated pace seen in the second half of 2013. I believe the fundamentals are stronger and headwinds that previously restrained growth have diminished. The current stance of monetary policy, the ultra-low policy interest rate, which is now accompanied by the wind down of the asset purchase program, is right for the outlook and the remaining work to be done. The pivotal question in terms of policy is when will it be appropriate for the Fed to raise the policy interest rate? To answer that question, I look to the state of inflation and employment. And I would argue both are well short of goal. The employment goal is expressed as full employment. Even with the progress made to date, a careful evaluation of the employment situation suggests to me that full employment is still a ways off and continued monetary accommodation is necessary. Those remarks, thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to entertain some questions. Um, members of the media who are here will have an opportunity to speak with Dennis Lockhart after the program, so I would ask that members of the audience who are not members of the media, please feel free to ask questions of Dennis now. Areas where there might be at least psychological headwinds that, that impact employment. One is the uncertainty about where tax rates will end up um, in terms of uh, does a businessman feel comfortable in hiring more people? Mm -hmm. There seems to be a general agreement that the corporate tax rate is too high, but there may be an inability to do anything about that without more revenue coming in from individual taxes. There mass, there's a massive disagreement about individual tax rates between the two parties, and obviously individual tax rates also impact small businesses directly. Um, the second is the impact of Obamacare and the uncertainty that that imparts to businessmen as to their f future costs uh, in terms of health care for their employees, and that may be a factor in drive in increasing part-time as opposed to full-time employment. The third, I don't know what, I, I can't quantify it, but at least recently you read the, there's an uh, impetus to increase um, the minimum wage, and that may have a negative effect, at least some, um, some prognosticators have said on, on health care. And I wondered if you could comment on, uh, on those potential headwinds. Well, they are not only potential headwinds, but they are to some extent historic headwinds, and that isn't, say 2011, 2012, uh, when I talked to business contacts, mostly in the southeast, but across the country as well, they would cite exactly those things, uncertainty about taxes, uncertainty about the Affordable Care Act, and they didn't cite the, the minimum wage so much at the time, it's, it's more of a recent proposal. Uh, but there clearly was during that period, 2011 and 12, um, a restraining effect of this uncertainty on the business community. And, um, you know, many business people would say things like, and it's, of course this for us is anecdotal, but it's meaningful. Um, I'm not hiring another person until I know what that person's gonna cost in terms of healthcare uh, expenses. That's a, that was a very typical comment at the time. Well, we always have uncertainties and those three areas of uncertainty have not really been eliminated by any stretch of the imagination. I think the Affordable Care Act picture is a little bit clearer, even though there's still some uncertainties. Uh, the, the, there haven't been changes in the tax rates. And uh, then the minimum wage question is, uh, I'm just gonna lean on the, the Congressional Budget Office's uh, uh, analysis uh, is, you know, has mixed inter interpretations in terms of what it's going to do 
overall for the economy, and I would say even within businesses. My sense is that the atmosphere simply is more positive than it was in 11 and 12, that business people um, feel enough more certain to be a bit more uh, aggressive about investment or even to some extent about hi hiring. We haven't seen, we have of course seen net job growth persistently now for, for two and a half years or more. Um, it's varied in its, its monthly volume, but we still are ha adding jobs to the economy. Uh, I, I'm giving you an atmospheric answer, but the atmosphere that I get when I talk mm. to people is simply more positive this year. So to some extent, those uncertainties seem to have declined or abated. Thank you. Mm. Peter. Uh, Dennis, if I understood you correctly, uh, the Fed's plan is to end QE by the end of this year, which I think would be great. Um, could you, in the process... Let me make sure I, I, I'm clear. I'm not speaking for the Fed, so no, I'm, sorry. I'm giving okay. you my opinion as to Got what, what the likely course of action is. Understood. Whenever QE ends, the Fed will have a $4 trillion balance sheet could you describe the methodology of unwinding this massive balance sheet? Well, sure, um, and I'll give a little bit of historical context to this. Um, when I joined the Fed in 2007, the central bank's balance sheet was about eight to nine hundred billion dollars, and today it's 4.2 trillion, or close to 4.2 trillion. So the balance sheet has expanded dramatically. Um, in economic theory, that is a, an increase in at least the monetary base, and therefore, again, in economic theory, that would be potentially inflationary if it sort of cut loose and began to, uh, began, began to circulate in the real economy. So it's for inflation, for those of us who are in, inflation focused, it's, it's a concern. I'm pretty confident, Peter, of our ability to wind that down, providing we have reasonable economic conditions over a number of years. And so you asked about how we're going to do that. What, what are the tools? Well, the first answer to the question is, what's the end point? And I would argue that whereas I had a, we had a balance sheet of seven, about, say, 800 to 900 billion in 2007, a reasonable estimation might be between a trillion and trillion and a half. So we don't have to get all the way back to the status quo ante 2007. Um, and there are a number of ways that can be done. We can reduce, I should explain that this balance sheet on the liability side is made up of excess bank reserves. It's sort of money that lies latent. It's on our balance sheet, but it hasn't really been lent into the economy. So that's on the liability side, and on the asset side are all the securities that we've been purchasing. We can um, neutralize the um, neutralize the excess reserves in various ways: short term through an instrument that's called reverse repurchase agreements and longer term by simply locking them up for a cost in longer term reserve deposits. But that basically neutralizes them. They cannot then cannot spill into the economy as loans. So those are our two tools. Uh, we can reduce some of the shorter maturities by simply letting them run off. So if we have a reasonable calm period of time, the shorter maturities can just mature, and what would happen then is we would, the security, we'd get the money back from the borrower, and then we do what only a central bank can do, we destroy the money. So uh, it, it, it's eliminated. <clears throat> um, the third option, of course, is to sell the securities, and that can be done at some pace and some mix between treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. 
Uh, I don't expect that this to, to be a quick process, and it's not without its risks and dangers, but I'm very confident that we can normalize that balance sheet over a period of time um, in a very deliberate way without disrupting the economy or financial markets. You, we can always get a curveball thrown at us, but I think the tools are there. We've tested the tools. So I have a, a, a high degree of confidence that can be done. Hi. So there's been a lot of uh, controversy lately, especially um, about kind of the international role the Fed plays. And uh, Step back a little. It's oh, maybe may a little easier to understand. Yeah. So uh, there's been some controversy lately uh, by some country, other countries, about the role that the Fed plays internationally, especially with the U.S. As, and the dollar as a reserve currency. And I was wondering if that ever enters any kind of consideration, uh, what kind of international ramifications tapering has or liftoff might have, or if that's just treated as just another transmission mechanism. Well, let me say a couple of things. First, uh, in the division of labor between the monetary people, which is the Federal Reserve, and the fiscal people, as well as other, let's call them um, foreign exchange related issues, it's the purview of the U.S. Treasury to worry about the role of the dollar and, and, and the exchange value of the dollar. Happens to be a subject, however, that I have some interest in, and so I've given it some thought and, and tried to read broadly on, on the subject as well. Um, it doesn't really factor greatly into the monetary policy deliberations um, unless there is a, a, an external turbulence of some kind, perhaps affecting the dollar, that then spills over into domestic demand or domestic uh, uh, economic activity. And I long ago learned when I was a banker to, uh, you know, not try to predict exchange values. They go up and down, and it's sometimes mysterious why the dollar appreciates or depreciates. Uh, the, the, the debt that is held by f foreign parties, uh, sovereign wealth funds and foreign governments, um, is substantial. And uh, so people raise the fear that somehow there would be a dumping of the dollar or a dumping of that debt, and that would cause a shock that would affect the economy. I just don't think that's very realistic because, um, in my view, uh, those who hold those assets do not want to take a 20 or 30 percent haircut by dumping them onto the market and, and losing a great deal of money. It's not in their self-interest to do so. So I don't view the external holding of our debt as a serious risk to our domestic economy, quite frankly. And as I said, in, our, in, in monetary policy deliberations, our focus is really largely on the domestic economy and anything that could affect it. And the dollar has not, is just not number one in thinking about uh, those concerns. Maybe one more? Uh, Professor Lockhart, man of the honor Thank of you saying for that. that. Thank you for because, that. Because uh, I had the uh, privilege of being at the School of Foreign Service, and uh, Professor Lockhart was a uh, professor of mine. We had a strategy workshop, and the question we always came up with was, what do you do when you don't know what to do? And the uncertain uh, future implications of, of policy and the like. And so um, my question was about slack in, in full employment. The bigger issue about, are we in a period where the economy is turning more towards a capital economy again? Technology, the importation of uh, issues that have basically transformed the economy. People don't have the skills to take jobs that are actually available. Coupled with an aging uh, population, people are naturally falling off. How does that factor into your thinking, uh, personally, uh, as, as the Fed, especially for that liftoff moment? Um, personally, I think that's an issue that's going to be with us for another five to ten years. That's a longer-term view. What do you what do? You do? What, what's the thinking? Well, um, one of the, the more... Um, complex and to some extent with unresolved questions fields that we deal with is uh, the nature of our employment markets. And they are much more dynamic than 
we would tend to think. Um, I think I have these statistics correct. I gave a talk on this several months ago. But at any, in any given month, historically between, say, 14 and 18 million people are making a transition of some kind out of the labor force, into the labor force, back to school, retirement, changing jobs or whatever. So, you know, we tend to think of the labor market as so, sort of some fixed thing and they're tremendously dynamic. And in any given period, uh, companies are destroying jobs and creating new jobs. They may net stay the same in terms of employment, but they are phasing out certain kinds of jobs or redefining them and, and creating new jobs. So it's a very, very dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, thing. And we don't fully understand all the reasons for uh, ch changes. In the relative short term, I would call it the medium term, which we consider liftoff, some of the questions of structural change or change in the composition of jobs um, are certainly going to be considered, but they're not gonna be decisive in making that decision. Um, a number of other considerations, and I spoke about, about, uh, about them, are, are, have to be weighed, but questions of sort of composition of jobs probably won't, that, that's a longer term trend issue in, in my mind. There's been some interesting work done, um, and one of the interesting findings is what's called job polarization. Uh, that idea uh, is, is describing an economy in which actually very low skill jobs have been uh, created and have been growing, and very high skill jobs have been growing, and in the middle has been the hollowing out. And to, to cite some of the thinking in this particular study, they, div they really divided the, the jobs or defined jobs as being either routine or non-routine and cognitive or um, essentially physical. And interestingly, the jobs that have been lost, either to offshoring or just, just to being eliminated because of automation or, or software, uh, have been in the um, cognitive routine category. That is brain work in the middle of institutions. Uh, brain work, but it's routine. It's the middle level administrative jobs. And that area has been hit pretty hard. Um, um, it, you know, software and automation of, of tasks and so forth. And I think that's very likely to continue. You know, from a, the perspective of a business person, um, you're going to try to make as efficient as possible any function in your company. And if you can do that by applying a software solution uh, and it's cost-effective, you're going to do that. Well, I don't think it's a near-term consideration for liftoff, but I think it is a, a, the, the, the makeup of our employment markets and whether they are a fit with the skill set of our citizenry, our populace, is a profound question, a very important question. And there's some very troubling aspects, uh, clearly. And, you know, anyone who is undereducated in this economy um, is going to be in a challenging situation, I think, um, unless they're just going to do absolutely bare bones physical labor at the very low end of the spectrum. Those jobs actually have been, have held up, I should say, is the way to put it. So that's a little bit uh, of a meandering answer, but that's the way I think about your question. Artemis, I think they're they are ready for dinner. <laughs> Thank you very much, I enjoyed it. So President and Professor, I thought this was a fascinating talk. 
It was clear, even to people like me, who are not deeply involved in all of this world. It's an example, however, of the sorts of people that we attract, the kinds of programs that the Georgetown University Library puts on. If you are not a member of the Georgetown Library Associates, I invite you very much to join us, to join us not only with the Campaign for Georgetown, but to engage with people like Dennis Lockhart, to listen to stimulating talks from time to time throughout the academic year. Miriam Nickerson, our Director of Development, will wave her hand. You can speak with her or with me. Join us in the Library Associates. But right now, join me in thanking, once again, Professor, President Dennis Lockhart. Thank you all very, very much. We hope to see you again soon. And thank you for coming.